Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Please sit down. Thank you. Right, thank you, colleagues. Right, given the amount of business on the agenda this evening and the hour is already late, I would like to propose that we actually go through the business as efficiently as possible. In order, and so in order to do this, I'm, su I'm suggesting that we aim to limit the number of speakers according to the standing orders. So I hope everybody will please cooperate with that. Right, item number one are the minutes. Uh, does council agree the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of November 2012? Agreed, Agreed thank you. Apologies for absence. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. We've had apologies from Councillors Beecham, Bell, Bird, Cott, Cross, Denham, Kevin Graham, Hindmarsh, Hoddart, Lambert, Lower, McStravick, George Patterson, Sharon Patterson, Salidas, Risk, Robinson, Shepherd, David Slesinger, and Margaret Wood, and Barry Phillipson as well. Thank you very much. I think we've got them. I've taken the sheets with the names of the councillors on them. Have we got those? Right, I'll call on the Leader of the Council to make an announcement on the Chancellor's autumn statement and allow the Leader of the Opposition to also comment. Thank you, Councillor Ford. Lord Mayor, given the recent events in the Chamber, I think it's even more important that uh, members think very deeply about the impact of the autumn statement which has been made today by the Chancellor, which I believe is yet another step in the wrong direction by this Government for the future of the country and for our economy. <coughs> Far from cuts being the answer to our economic problems, I think cuts are showing us to be pushing our economy further backwards. They've proved to increase debt and have led to lower growth. And the government, rather than changing track, is uh, proposing yet more cuts to public services. Uh, members will know that I've already written to the Prime Minister to highlight that their current programme of cuts to local government is extremely painful, counterproductive, and in many cases will create false economies which will end up costing us more. But the announcement today shows that the government is set on the same path for the economy as a whole. And I believe we need to increase our case to the government that the overall approach that they are adopting to the economy is flawed. All the Chancellor has to show for three years of austerity is increased unemployment, rising debt, a shrinking economy, and the risk of a triple-dip recession. And the autumn statement also continues the government's assault on the welfare system, with £4 billion further cuts to be made. This is to be achieved by a year-on-year -year cut in the living standards of the poorest people in society, and from working families struggling to get by on tax credits. And the impact on the public services in Newcastle are only just becoming clear in the last hour or so. We already know that local government has faced some of the worst cuts in the public sector. And evidence from the local government association shows that uh, cuts will make the sector as a whole unviable by 2020. But the Chancellor has announced a further £445 million in cuts for councils. For Newcastle, this could result in an additional cut over the three-year period that the Council is currently consulting on for its budget of an additional £7 million, in addition to the £90 million that we are already having to find. And this government, I think, is pushing public service to the absolute limits of what can be achieved. The Chancellor has redistributed government funding from the north to the south, from urban to rural areas, from the more deprived to the more affluent areas. This means that Newcastle is one of, already one of the worst affected areas in the country. And a number of other councils have actually been able to increase their reserves because they've not been able to spend the additional funding that they've had in this current financial year. So Lord Mayor, we need to encourage the government even more than, they, than we have been able to do so up to now to take a fairer approach. The government should distribute the cuts that they are making 
to the areas that are under the least pressure, not those areas that have already suffered the consequences of their current unfair and vindictive approach to council funding. And I'm calling on the government to make any cuts from next year onwards to be made on the same per capita basis around the country. Further cuts to the amount based on need would be unacceptable and cause further irreparable damage to the public services here in Newcastle. Now, there are a number of items in the autumn statement which should be welcomed, including the confirmation of the funding for the uh, uh, Western Bypass improvements. But the autumn statement, I think, raises far more concerns than it gives assurance. And therefore, we need to stay engaged with government rather than simply walking away, but continue and step up the fight for a fairer deal. We need to use all of our influence as a city council to build a coalition of interest with businesses, with community organisations and public institutions across the city. We need to collaborate more between the core cities. We need a wider and deeper collaboration within the North East itself. And I believe we need to lead a countrywide coalition against a centralised system of arts funding which has favoured London at the expense of the regions. Lord Mayor, these are dark times indeed for our public services. It's essential that people feel that they have a voice and that that is exercised in a fair and democratic way. My concern is that the government has not so far shown that it is prepared to listen to the argued and reasoned case that we are making. And it is even more incumbent on us to work together as a city to unite to lobby for a better funding settlement for the city to protect our communities, to protect our public services and to protect our economy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Faulkner. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, I think the leader of council knows and council uh, in its entirety will know that there's a fair amount of common ground on how we should lobby what our case should be. And I'm certainly prepared to support the leader's uh, proposition that per capita cuts should now not be uh, applied on a percentage basis, but should actually be uh, on, a, on a flat uniform basis. And I think that might go some way towards redressing some of the uh, imbalance that we clearly have and we will no doubt debate uh, in more detail uh, with his motion later on. Um, however, what I don't share and what we don't share is his uh, analysis of the uh, uh, reason why we're here because the government is trying to do two things. The first is to reduce the deficit, which he's inherited, and it's actually reduced the deficit by a quarter already and has saved £33 billion, which the Chancellor said was uh, equivalent to the full amount of the defence budget in a full year in terms of interest payment on, on, on uh, the debt. Uh, and I welcome that. Um, uh, and it obviously is going to take a lot longer. And I'm sorry it's going to take longer. And I'm sorry that cuts are as deep and painful as they're going to be. But I do welcome, and I've said this in my amendment to his motion later on, the fact that, uh, that there's been a fair degree, and this continues, of protection on education spending, on health spending, on science and economic development, and on overseas aid. And I applaud all of that. The consequence of all of that, of course, is that certain sectors and local government, unfortunately, is one of them, bears a disproportionate burden of the cuts. Uh, I'm, I welcome the fact that, that, that he announced that there will be no increase <coughs> in the cut on the local government revenue, revenue formula for next year. That should help in, uh, in, our, in our budgeting, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and I too shall uh, campaign against the proposed cut of 2% uh, for the subsequent year. Although we are told, and perhaps he didn't know this, that there might be some good news around the top slicing and the damping, which has been so disadvantageous <coughs> to areas like ours. Not just the north, not just Newcastle and the northeast, but actually many London boroughs. You simplify it. And, and you do the debate a disservice by pretending it's north v south. It is very much about those areas that have had to, because of need, received a large uh, subsidy and support in the past, wh which when you apply a percentage uh, cut, you do, of course, mean you get a, per a bigger per capita reduction for those areas. Um, and, and I regret that, and as he knows, I've campaigned against it as well for some amelioration. I shall continue to do so, and so will my party. Thank you very much. Uh, the other announcement is, as mentioned at the last meeting, the agenda for the 9th of January 2013, the council meeting will be circulated before the Christmas holidays, so the deadline for items will be on Thursday the 20th of December. Item 4, correspondence. We have received no official correspondence since the last meeting. Item 5 is the introduction of the new councillor. 
and I call upon Councillor Kane to introduce Councillor Stephen Powers. He's a new member for the Usburn Ward and to then invite Councillor Powers to reply. Thank you very much, Councillor Kane. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm speaking in place of my colleague Stephen Salidas, who unfortunately was knocked off his bike last Friday. Uh, he's recovering well, but I'm sure Council will send their, uh, their best wishes to him. Uh, so it falls upon me to introduce uh, Stephen Powers. We've got two Stephen P's in the ward. It's very confusing already. Uh, he's 26 years old. He's from Wheatley Hill in County Durham, uh, where I believe he uh, grew up and went to school, and, but then moved to Newcastle to study politics at the University of Northumbria. He's now settled in Heaton with his partner, uh, working for a hospitality company. Now, just to summarize a little bit, because we're pressed for time, throughout all of that uh, time, he seems to have worked for a huge number of uh, voluntary groups, charities, or uh, supported charities, um, and supported other campaigns, uh, a lot of them around uh, community involvement. And most, late, uh, most recently, the hardest hit campaign, which is uh, clearly very topical in the current economic situation. Um, Stephen Sladis and I had a very good and constructive working relationship with his predecessor in Preston. And we fully look forward to continuing that relationship um, with Stephen. Uh, we think he's been elected to one of the to represent one of the, the best boards in the city, if not in the country. Uh, it's a very great pleasure, it's a very great pl privilege, and I think you will enjoy it. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stephen. Thank you very much. Right, Councillor Powers. Uh, thank you very much to Councillor Kane for that warm introduction. Um, before she stepped in to recover for uh, Councillor Salidas, who suffered an accident, and uh, I wish him a speedy recovery. Um, I would like to thank very much to the supporters of my campaign, um, and speaking to as many residents as possible during the election um, and, and, and really um, get out there and talk to as many people as possible in, within the ward. Um, thank you, of course, to all the, the staff at the Civic Centre who ran a very uh, smooth polling day operation and uh, it was a great success. Um, I'd also particularly like to thank the residents who have, uh, who have voted for me. Um, I had pledged to all the residents that if I was elected, I'd work extremely hard in their ward and they have put their trust in me and I aim to honour that pledge and work very hard for all the individuals within my ward, um, especially in these difficult times our current city faces. Thank you. Thank you very much. But the next item six is petitions, and we have received two requests. The first one, Councillor Higgins, um, it's a petition on behalf of a local resident behalf of the users of Denton Burn Library regarding the proposed closure. Thank you very much, Councillor Higgins. Yes, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. It's actually a petition with several hundred signatures on it, and notwithstanding the fact that there are many state constituent decisions about libraries, they are what they are dear to my heart, and therefore I do ask for the protection of the petition. The petition reads, I really emphasise our very controversial year of the proposals to close Denton Burn Library, following the loss of spectral libraries is now vital resource for many children and families Thank you, Councillor Higgins. And does Council agree to the petition be referred to the relevant Cabinet member and Executive Director? Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, second petition, Councillor Stone, on behalf of the local residents regarding speeding problems on the, on the residential sections of the Coast Road in Cochrane Park and on behalf of Councillor Huddett. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, as, as you say, I'm transmitting to Councillor Council Huddett, who's unwell. Uh, we, the underside, call upon Newcastle City Council to take action to address speeding problems on the residential sections of the Coast Road and Cochrane Park, specifically the slip road leading between Redhall Drive to the Coast Road itself by the, by the Royal Pier Wing. Right, thank you very much. Does, uh, does Council agree to refer the petition to the relevant, relevant ca Cabinet Member and Executive Director? Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Right, public question time. We have received two requests to address the Council, each participant having up to five minutes. Um, the first one, I call upon Mr. Jason Smith to address the Council regarding the provision for consultation on the Council budget proposals and to then invite the Leader of the Council to reply. Thank you, Mr. Jason. Mr. Smith, sorry. <laughs> sorry. My children find it difficult to understand why I knock on doors in Newcastle 
but when something affects them, they see why they need to stand up for their community. Well, Lord Mayor, in 2016, all children will understand the impact of a scorched earth budget for Newcastle, which claims to be about fair choices. Babies will hear their parents complain about vermin attracted by the stench of 13-day-old nappies in the wheelie bin. Newcastle's children may never get the chance to learn to swim after this administration followed its predecessors by closing the city's swimming pools. Children in the eight wards with the poorest GCSE results will have lost their local library. Are these fair choices? I know from personal experience that when parents see their, their child falling behind at school, they need the support of professionals to help understand the problem. If the educational psychology service is decimated, you will be responsible for destroying the life chances of children. Is that a fair choice? <coughs> More shocking of all is the closure of Castle Dean and Cheviot View respite centres. Closing a lifeline for local families is nothing short of a disgrace. I have been told by one parent that, parent that short breaks have helped her children to build friendships, gain skills, and have experience that most other children can enjoy. It gives mum and dad quality time to recharge their batteries and be better carers. I agree with Ed Miliband that carers make huge sacrifices and we owe it to them to make sure they get the help and support they deserve. Clearly this council does not. It is not just the children who will suffer from this budget. Church congregations, commuters, shoppers, people who die, the elderly, people without access to the internet, all will be fair game with this budget, except, it seems, councillors and council-funded union reps. Paying a living wage is a decision that in good times would be commended, but in the current climate, this council will spend millions to simply reduce tax credits for council employees, Newcastle Council subsidising central government. Sadly, this budget shows the lowest paid losing their jobs due to a living wage that puts the people it should help on the dole. Is that a fair choice? Fairness is about making sensible choices that do not devastate the city's quality of life. How can we judge fairness when this budget is 1,327 pages long and is only available in 19 sections involving 104 different web links? This consultation offers no alternatives for residents to compare these dogmatic plans with other choices to decide for themselves what is fair. The actual cut in the government formula grant is 39.3 million. 90 million is spin to hide the choices made by this administration. Lord Mayor, this council faces great challenges and it alarms me when I see councillors squabbling over the running order of a meeting because the ruling group has changed it to suit its own political agenda. Our politicians need to work together and with residents for the good of our city. We all need, we all need to help to find solutions to the problem. Despite its many words, the budget consultation does not provide residents <coughs> with enough information to offer that advice to the council. According to the Leader of Council's motion, if the council receives an additional 22 million from the government, it could save libraries, leisure facilities, Castle Dean Respite Centre, older people's resource, resource centres, street cleaning service, and lots of other things. In the same three year period, the council will have a budget of 736 million and a capital budget of 418 million. So why is the loss of 22 million leading to this scorched Newcastle budget. The council is intending to spend 18 million on the Civic Centre, 12 million on el entrances to Eldon Square, and millions of pounds on a transport scheme to make their plans to destroy the green belt more palatable. Are these the priorities of residents? A sledgehammer should never be used to crack a nut. Well, here we have a nutcase budget that is hammering residents in all areas in pursuit of a contrived political dogma. It creates a council unfit for purpose, dumping its responsibilities onto residents. As the budget stands, I have to conclude that this administration wants a working city, but is cutting the jobs of 1,300 council workers, wants decent neighbourhoods, but is destroying the very communities they claim to want to look after, wants to tackle inequalities, but is destroying the services for our most vulnerable citizens and carers. Lord Mayor, the administration cannot escape its decision to invest in some things while cutting services that people rely on. 
If a scorched earth policy marks out a cooperative council, then I'll settle for one that is fit for purpose. It is clear to me that the only thing that is fair about this budget is its name. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to start with some facts to enlighten Mr. Smith uh, in his deliberations. Firstly, this government chose to cut local government funding by 28%, more than any other government department. Secondly, they chose to change the formula in the way that that 28% cut was distributed around the country, which has meant that Newcastle has been seriously disadvantaged. And what looked like a 28% cut average nationally has been nearer a 40% cut in our grant to Newcastle. Thirdly, Newcastle suffers from a low council tax base, which means that the amount that the council is able to raise through council tax is far lower than the amount that other councils are able to re re raise as a proportion of their budget. And fourthly, the government chose to cut a number of specific funding streams which supported specific activities targeted towards deprivation, such as the Working Neighbourhoods Fund, which helped to get people into employment, such as the Supporting People Grant, which helped people with mental health conditions to stay in supported accommodation, such as the Early Intervention Grant, which helped to protect children from disadvantaged backgrounds and give them a better start in life. And all of these facts have conspired together to mean that the cuts nationally announced have had a far greater and far disproportionate effect on Newcastle than other parts of the country, which is why, Lord Mayor, taking <coughs> into account the size of the cuts that we face from the government and unavoidable cost pressures, over the next three years, we anticipate the Council will have to lose £90 million out of its flexible revenue budget. Now, that £90 million, as I've just said earlier on in my, in my response to the autumn statement, may actually increase to somewhere near £100 million, depending on what the detail of the government's announcements are over the next few weeks. But the, uh, Mr. Smith refers to the issue of cost pressures. And I just want to explain to Council, and to Mr. Smith in particular, what cost pressures are and why they are of some, such concern to us and why they create unavoidable pressure in the budget that accounts for the total of the £90 million. We have an increasing number of looked after children in the city. The last count that I saw just last week was 546 subject to a full court order and 320 subject to further protection of one form or another. And each of these looked after children requires quite a high level of legal support and emotional and family support to make sure that they are cared for and protected. Not all the children in the city grow up in the stable, comfortable family environment that Mr. Smith's children enjoys, and it is our responsibility as a local authority to protect them from the uh, circumstances in their lives which would otherwise expose them to risk of violence or physical or sexual abuse. Secondly, Lord Mayor, the number of people who require long-term residential care is also increasing. We have an ageing population. We know that that's the case. But we also see family breakdowns, and we see people moving into residential care at a long-term cost to the council. And we also see, Lord Mayor, the economic impact making a huge a hole in the council's projected finances. So, for example, the council raises a significant amount of money through parking revenue, yet the projected income that the council will not get over the next few years as a result of the economic downturn means that the gap that the council has to achieve from that parking revenue is getting even greater. We are subject to rising energy prices like any other household. We're subject to rising utility costs like any other household. These cost pressures, Lord Mayor, are a combination of rising costs in things beyond our control and rising demand for our services beyond our immediate control. And it is vital that we do what we can to seek to address them. Now, Mr. Smith talks about all of the things that he <coughs> finds unpalatable in the budget proposals. I find many of them unpalatable myself. 
But when the Council is faced with a situation of losing more than one-third of its flexible revenue budget over the next three years, we cannot simply set back and allow the Council to get into debt. That will not do. And therefore, what we are proposing are some extremely painful, some extremely damaging, some extremely counterproductive, and in my view, uh, cuts which in many cases will lead to false economies. But we have no choice in that matter. We have to put forward a balanced budget. We have to make sure that the Council's finances are secure for the future. Mr Smith confuses, and I know he's an intelligent man because I've worked with him professionally. He deliberately chooses to confuse the revenue budget and the capital budget. He knows full well, because he has read the papers, that many of the proposals in the capital budget are in themselves either self-financing or will do, go some way to reducing the revenue cost pressures that this council faces. And therefore, I say to him, do not be disingenuous in your interpretation of the papers. Read them very carefully. For example, the investment that you criticise in the Civic Centre will actually save £1 million on the revenue budget uh, above and beyond the capital costs that are put in. And if we don't make that investment, and that the investment is partly being made so that we can close other council offices, save on running costs, save on office overheads. If we don't make that investment, the cost pressures on the revenue budget will be even greater. And the investment in Eldon Square is a similar case in point, where actually the income that is being invested through, sorry, the, the capital resources that are being invested through the capital programme are actually fully recouped by the retention of business rates, which we uh, retain throughout the uh, business re rate retention system. So, Oops, Lord Mayor, Mr. Mr. Smith, <coughs> Mr. Smith may choose to come into this council chamber and lecture us on what he finds unpalatable. I encourage him to get involved in the consultations in a positive way, to engage with the consultation to see what he can seek to help us to run with the local community. Uh, and I'm reminded, Lord Mayor, that uh, Mr. Smith has come tonight to target his anger at this council. The target for his anger should be the Conservative-led government, which he helped to elect in 2010 when he was a Conservative candidate. And so we will take no lectures from him about how to organise the city's finances. And I say to him directly, you can either engage in a positive way or you can continue your uh, cynical uh, spreading of mistruths and half-truths like you've done it in the newspaper this week about councillors and allowances. But we will continue to do what is in the right interests of the city and I am convinced, Lord Mayor, that we have done what we can so far to propose a fair budget for the city. If other people have other ideas about how it could be fairer, we are willing to listen. <coughs> Right. Our second public question time, a call on the representatives of the Newcastle Area Command volunteer police cadets to address the council regarding their work in the city and then invite Councillor Murison to reply. And Councillor Murison, can you keep your reply short? We are running against the clock tonight. Thank you very much, cadets. We're very happy to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Are you uh, okay there? You all right? That's fine. Thank you. Good morning, Lord Mayor councillors and invited guests. We are members of the Newcastle Area Command Volunteer Police Cadet Group, and we will give, be giving a short input on our scheme. In May 2012, each area command in Northumbria Police recruited 18 volunteer police cadets on a two-year training program. The scheme is open to young people aged 14 to 15 years who are in school year nine or 10. Recruitment to the police cadets involved an application and interview process that was a new experience for us all. Next spring, we begin our second year, and a further 18 cadets will be recruited to begin a new two-year scheme. The aims of our scheme are to provide opportunities for young people to enhance their life and citizenship skills, provide a structured training program to enable cadets to become valued members of the community, promote crime prevention and problem-solving problem initiatives, provide a valuable resource that can help support initiatives at a local level and be visible within the area command. Here in Newcastle, our group has 12 male and six female ca cadets from across the area command, representing several ward areas. 
During term time, we meet weekly every Wednesday evening at Heaton Manor School for a two-hour training session. In our induction phase, we have trained in topics similar to those covered by a police officer. For example, equality, diversity, and standards of behavior in a disciplined organization. The group have also learned about the role of a police officer, communication and observation skills, teamwork and problem solving, and most importantly, first aid. We have also begun to work towards our Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award and successfully completed our practice expedition in the North Pennines and qualifying expedition in the Cheviots during the autumn. On our expeditions, we worked hard on improving our communication, teamwork, organization, and planning skills. Unique to Newcastle Area Command, our cadet group operates alongside the Air Army cadets, working in partnership and supporting each other, others' ventures. During our time as a police cadet, we will be doing some fundraising activities for our nominated charity, the Children's Cancer Award at the RVI, and we'll be assisting trading standards with the test purchase operations. We will be working with a local charity whose aims is to break down barriers between elderly people and teenagers, meeting residents of a care home and pro providing reassurance. Following our initial training, volunteer cadets in Newcastle Area Command have been involved in working within the community on several occasions. So far, members of our group have attended several community events, including the Miller Festival on the Town Moor, a school fair in, he in Heaton, a primary school careers day in Elswick, the YHN Youth Festival at the Civic Centre. We assisted with crowd and traffic control at the firework display at Jesmond Cricket Ground. Our group attended the Remembrance Day Parade in Newcastle, where we laid a wreath. In October, we assisted the council with conducting community satisfaction surveys in the Heaton area. This gave us an opportunity to work in a partnership alongside the council whilst meeting members of the community. In November, we assisted in an operation giving crime prevention advice to the student population in the Jesmond area. We have all enjoyed working with and helping people in the communities we serve in Newcastle and look forward to meeting many more people during the rest of our time representing Northumbria Police. You are welcome to join us at one of our training evenings. If you would like any further information or if we could assist with anything in your ward area, our contact details are with Linda Scott in the Democratic Services Department. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Right, thank you very much. I'm sure that was quite intimidating since you've got the Chief Constable sitting in the audience tonight and Vera Bird as well. But you did extremely well, didn't they? Right, excellent. So I'm sure you've got a very good future in front of you. Right, Councillor Murison. Thank you, um, Lord Mayor. And I understand that the, the scheme was originally um, started, I believe, uh, in Gateshead. So it does prove that there are, there are many good things we can learn from our near neighbours. Um, I just wanted to, to thank um, the young people who've come this evening, but also the rest of the group for the work they've done in the time they've been working alongside the police. I will, um, Lord Mayor, keep my remarks very brief, but I do think it's particularly worth stating that with many of the challenges we have in our city, that actually this is a very good example of the importance of having good quality public services, but services who work with people who want to contribute something and take their skills, their expertise, and what they're willing to contribute and help put it towards the purpose which we're all here, both in this chamber, but across all the people who work in the public sector in our city. And I would like to particularly thank them for the efforts they've made um, in reaching out to other communities. I think particularly whether it be to students in terms of some of the benefits that can bring to some of their fellow peers in education in the city, whether it be to older people. I think those types of activities are particularly beneficial um, for not just themselves, but the other young people in the city, who as well as representing Northumbria Police, I also think they're fine representatives of the world now. And so on behalf of myself and, and my deputy camp member um, for community safety, I'm sure that both myself and Councillor Hobson will certainly be taking up the offer the cadets have made this evening. And I do hope other, other members of council will do the same. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I would like to welcome back to the council Sue Sim, the Chief Constable, and also welcome tonight Vera Bird, who is attending her first council meeting since her appointment as the new Police and Crime Commissioner. 
Each will give a presentation of up to five minutes on crime and community safety issues in relation to the city, and I would then invite questions from members, but I'm actually limiting the questions to six because, because we have a very long agenda and we have a short time. So I hope you understand that. Thank you very much, ladies. Would you, who's going to go first? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and thank you very much, councillors. Them weren't they absolutely great? I'm hugely, hugely proud of them. You did very well, and you can judge me now. Marks out of ten, and ten is a very good one. Okay. <laughs> right. I know time's short, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me back to address you all. As last year, Gary is here to answer any of the difficult questions that you have. I just answer your very easy ones which is normally none, because you're a very challenging council. Last year, I outlined, again, as you have tonight, the very difficult position that we are all in as public services in relation to the reductions to the funds that we have. We have restructured Northumbria Police, some of its core services in relation to the delivery of, for example, our crime department, our operations department. We have reduced our workforce substantially. We are going to have to make further reductions to our workforce. What I do have and will give again my commitment to you is that my passion, my belief is exactly the same as that of our communities and that is the delivery of neighborhood policing and maintaining a strong frontline service <coughs> delivery. I will maintain our 24-7 response resources and our neighbourhood policing teams across the area command. That is what our communities keep telling me in relation to the work that we do together. And that's what I intend to do in the future with policing resources. That does mean to say that we do have to reconfigure all the remaining policing resources and departments that we have. We're constantly striving to reduce bureaucracy. Our aim is to keep our officers out on the street as often as possible and our police community support officers. I again maintain my commitment to the delivery of the number and the maintenance of the number of police community support officers that we actually have out patrolling your wards, our beats and our neighbourhoods. I also intend to make sure that all of our access points are and remain open. Our communities work with us to tell us when they want to see the officers, when they want the police stations open and that's a commitment that I intend to adhere to. One of the things that I would like to thank you, the Newcastle Local Authority, for is the strong commitment that you have to working in partnership with us, your local police force. Gary is, though I don't tell him very often, one of the finest area commanders that I have, and he works diligently to deliver with all the officers and police and community support officers in your area. He works very hard to deliver with you an effective partnership working to make sure that we address the crime and disorder issues within our communities. Thank you very much for working with us to uh, allow us into your buildings so that we can have different access service areas, that's very important. Our local community should tell us where they want to see us and we should work with you to do that. Our commitment remains to reduce crime and disorder, um, to reduce and work with you to address issues of antisocial behaviour because as we all know, the reduction of antisocial behaviour isn't just a policing is issue, it's a partnership issue 
It's one that we're very good at and it's one that we'll continue to improve at. We're very committed to carry on delivering the excellent service that you and our communities want us to carry on delivering. We are looking at ways that we can all strive to continue to deliver that excellent public service that you expect and actually demand quite rightly from us. Our commitment remains that we will carry on delivering that for you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lord Mayor, I'd like somebody standing beside me to answer the difficult questions. As the newly elected first police and crime commissioner that Northumbria has ever had, it's a real privilege to come and speak to you, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to do so. I'm sure you're well aware that the territory I have to represent is a very large one. There are two and a half thousand square miles. There are 1.5 million occupants. But Newcastle is, of course, the centre of the universe, uh, as always. And it is very good that I've come to you first, and that I am very interested uh, in addressing you about how we can work together. Clearly, as an elected representative, I share the democratic obligation that you all have and clearly, particularly at a time of stress, uh, financial austerity, but at all times, it's imperative that democratically elected people work together with each other as best they may in the common interest of the community. And so I look forward very strongly to being able to do that. The role of Police and Crime Commissioner was not well explained by the coalition government before it launched it upon an unsuspecting electorate. Let me just make very clear what it is, since there is still a coterie of people, a very sizable one, who think that it is somehow electing Sue Sim rather than someone like me. Uh, it, it never was that, and it isn't that. The role, of course, is to represent the public, and that is what I will faithfully and strongly do, as you do yourselves. The role is to consult the police authority has now gone, and it had some role to liaise with the public, but the role of police and crime commissioner is a very much stronger consultative obligation. So I am charged now with the task of going to all of those four corners of those two and a half thousand square miles and seeing all of the rural and urban and men and women and old and young, and you can think of the polarities for yourselves, and I have to consult each and every such community, and I have to try to ensure that what they want from the police is distilled through me, a fully visible and elected representative, into the five-year policing and crime plan, which I must agree with the Chief Constable. And that is my primary role, and then I stand back and I watch the Chief Constable deliver that plan, again, with the public monitoring and scrutinizing and ensuring that we have pushed the police in the right strategic direction for our needs, that no community is being excluded from the level of care that the Chief Constable is extremely committed to uh, providing. So that is the essential role. Its advantages are probably reasonably self-evident because there is a visible person who has that obligation and so the prospect is that you can bring the police and the public closer together and that must be the overwhelming target. It is another, has in another way an interesting aspect to it because it is, uh, it has a broad remit. There is an obligation on a commissioner to cooperate with the local community safety partnerships, and I'll come back to that in a minute because that's a very real interest. Of course, the policing role I've indicated. There's also an obligation on the commissioner to cooperate with the local criminal justice board. And that, I think, for the first time, puts into the remit of one office the whole of criminal justice from the beginning packaging up what we hope can be successful interventions to stop young people getting involved in crime in the first place, all of the crime prevention and all of the crime detection work the police do, and then the criminal justice processes, which often do not 
dovetail particularly helpfully with all of the rest. So I, I think that what we can look at is some more holistic approaches to working in the, uh, the strong hope of, of improving service to the public. My priorities are, I, I think, going to coincide very closely with those of the Chief Constable. Neighbourhood policing, which she has set her stall out to protect, is very dear to me. I believe that it's been a key component in reducing crime in the way that it has, and it is a huge compliment to the Chief Constable that over the last year, despite the pressure of cuts, crime has been cut by a further 10%. I think that that mix of civilian PCSOs and active police officers in the community merging and, and melding with the community is an excellent tool upon which we can build to improve yet further. Clearly antisocial behaviour remains uh, here and there in pockets and she and I share an intention to investigate as closely as we can why that does recur and how we can tackle it strongly. Clearly both of those aspects require close working with a council like yourselves because the neighbourhood policing duty has lots of environmental overlap with your own duties. Equally antisocial behaviour uh, is closely linked with some of the duties uh, you perform. Thirdly, my priority will be victims. I'm not putting them in a particular order and clearly you have obligations in particular to vulnerable victims who will be uh, very keen to be protected and I shall ensure when I go out and consult those vulnerable people, hard to reach communities are nonetheless reached by me. And it will not come as a surprise to many people uh, uh, who know me to know that um, domestic violence and broader sexual abuse and violence against women will be a priority uh, for me uh, as well. And I know that good work has been done in this council on that topic too. So I see absolutely no difficulty in committing strongly to working with you uh, in shared democratic obligation to the public across all of these areas. I am, if there is a spectrum of uh, police commissioners yet established, I am certainly from the prevention and early intervention side of things. There is a very good recent report called Taking Time for Crime, which talks about, because there are huge cost pressures down on the police now, the inability to simply carry on doing the kind of job that's been being done by the police, but do it for less money. What, of course, the costs come in when a crime is committed. So there is the embryo of an idea that police officers should be less process driven out on the beat and more freed up to do a problem solving, roving kind of approach. Now that's in its early stages, but HMIC, the inspectorate have launched a plan like that. I certainly see that as a potential way forward and it clearly um, is an area of activity in which involvement with the council will be extremely important and so I look forward if to If we're going to have time that. for questions, I'd like, could you bring it to an end? Because oh, then we've like set to... aside a certain amount of time That's and people fine. would like to ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you. May, may I finish yeah, with yeah, sure. two minutes yes. what I want to say? Uh, and it is this, that the cuts are disgraceful and their impact on the police has been fought off as valiantly as possible by the Chief Constable. I very much regret to say that today it becomes clear that probably another 1% will be taken from our police budget today in the autumn statement and another 2% next year. That will make it extremely difficult to maintain the level of service for which she has fought. Our actual allocation will be clear on the 19th of December uh, and I do not think that it is going to encourage us to have a happy Christmas. Nonetheless, she and I, the Chief Constable and I, share a total commitment to the reduction of crime and the enhancement of community <coughs> safety in this city, which is nothing more or less than our citizenship requires and can expect. And I would want to add this footnote. You've seen the young people here, you've seen the Chief Constable herself, and you probably know the area commander extremely well. The real truth is that this police service is an excellent one. It is always in the top four of police, whatever is being managed, whatever is being measured, and it must continue so. But our ambition, I believe I can say this jointly, 
is that we will be able to work together with the new structures and with councils that are committed to this area like yourselves in order to ensure that Northumbria Police doesn't remain in one of the top four, but it becomes, despite the cuts, the best in the country. Thank you very much. Councillor McCarty, can you indicate to whom you wish your, your question to, to be addressed to? <laughs> thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, it, it's um, a very short question, but I'd just like to say thank you to Sue um, for her commitments made to frontline policing. I think everyone across the council chamber will welcome that. I want to thank Gary for keeping Newcastle safe. Um, you know, the officers in the city um, indeed do look after us all. Um, um, my comments really are to Vera, Lord Mayor. Um, she will know and has already mentioned that one of the um, priorities of the City Council is to reduce domestic violence. Um, I hope today she's received a copy of the report which is now in the public domain which is coming to Cabinet next week. Um, and um, I think I'd like to invite Vera to come meet with us. Um, we want to explore partnership working. We know that partnership working, working more closely, is the only way that we can improve things uh, across the city. Um, and I want to echo what you're saying about working together on early intervention and prevention. So um, can we look forward to working more closely together uh, and, and especially on this issue? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, which gives me the opportunity to refer to the five pledges which all Labour Police and Crime Commissioner candidates set out in their manifestos for tackling uh, substantially and deeply violence against women. All five of them will require partnership working uh, and I have had the report but not an opportunity to look through it in any kind of depth but we must meet uh, as soon as we can. This is an issue uh, which is very severely impacting upon the quality of life of families and children in this city, uh, and it is one upon which we must work with great urgency. Thank you, Councillor Hobson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Firstly, I'd like to offer my um, congratulations to Vera Baird on her election to Northumbria's first Police and Crime Commissioner, and of course, welcome. Um, Chief Constable Sue Sims um, back to council. Um, and I have to make reference to the fact that um, Northumbria is leading the way in being the only area in the country to have uh, women as both um, Police and Crime Commissioner and the Chief Constable. <laughs> and uh, as already has been mentioned, um, Newcastle is facing unprecedented, unprecedented financial cuts from the government. Um, just like for you to uh, offer a, a bit more thought, Vera, and how we, the council, the police and crime commissioner yourself, and the police can work even closer together than we already do, do to protect our communities um, and to work with our communities to reduce crime and protect the most vulnerable in our society. Well, thank you very much for the question and thank you very much for the congratulations yeah. too. Um, it, it, it is a, a, a very good thing that Northumbria has uh, two women in this post. Um, there is already speculation in the press about whether we share a hairdresser. <laughs> but I hope the level of debate can rise somewhat higher uh, than that uh, at large. I think that we can jointly commit to doing a great deal uh, well together. Uh, and I, I know the Chief Constable has a very keen interest in the community safety work that's done jointly with the Council. I imagine the possibilities granted the remit of my office is to oversee all six of the community safety partnerships and that will be an early thing to which I'll turn my attention. I can imagine the possibility of working in a different way with all six of the community safety partnerships and encouraging them to work in a more integrated way and that there may be opportunities for streamlining, there may be opportunities for taking best practice from one area and either spreading it to another or perhaps putting that area in charge of the thing that they do best in return for reciprocal services and something that another area does the best. There seem to me to be a lot of opportunities, a great deal of skill in the local community safety partnerships, all of whom I've met with in one form or another so far, and a, and a great deal uh, to do to make sure that we deliver, even in austerity, what we can for our, our community. Thank you, Councillor Higgins.
all our time today in court to essentially to put this step forward in a negotiation and so vital important to affect this as quickly as possible. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the question and thank you for the invitation to go to Benwell, which I did, and I'll come again uh, for sure as soon as you. Uh, you would like me to do. I completely agree with you about the imperative nature of keeping the probation service in the public sector and keeping it together so that it doesn't fragment. Indeed, this is a question that was uh, leveled to the Home Secretary, Theresa May, on Monday when the Police and Crime Commissioners collectively met with her for the first time, that she wouldn't give any commitment. And that leads me to think that you're absolutely right to set up a campaign to try to make sure that this occurs, because I feel that there's a real danger. Uh, for it. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this question mainly to Vera Baird, but Sisa may wish to comment as well. Um, one area that residents often raise uh, with us is, is the problem of road safety and speeding. And whilst I realise that in straightened times, obviously tackling crime has to be the top priority, do you still feel this is an area that the police should be involved in? Um, and I, I particularly want to refer to the fact that we've now introduced 20 mile an hour speed limits on almost all our residential streets and there has been some reluctance from the police before to, to get the necessary equipment to be able to enforce the 20 mile an hour speed limit. Um, but you know, we do still see um, um, children and uh, adults being killed on our streets and it's obviously terribly distressing for the whole community when that happens. So is that still a priority? I mean, the, the issue for me is very much around the fact what, what is the priorities of our communities. Certainly up in Northumberland, I've got uh, people who work with the police, local volunteers who actually are involved with speed cameras. They don't prosecute people, but they do send warning letters out to people, which helps. Because of course, one of the things that they found up in Northumberland is the majority of people who are speeding through the streets are actually the local residents themselves, which doesn't help things. But our commitment is whatever your priorities are and your local community's priorities are, if it is speeding, then yes, we will be involved with that. But what we've got to look at is different ways of delivering it. <coughs> it doesn't necessarily need to be a police officer, as we've shown quite rightly in Northumberland. They've had a significant reduction up there of people speeding through their communities, and it's because their own local community volunteers have been helping the PCSOs and the officers to address issues. But it is around where our communities place their local priorities in relation to community safety, and of course all areas are different. started and ended, the, my, if my, my job is to go out and find out what our community priorities, and I'll do that with great diligence, uh, and then we'll give appro appropriate level in the policing and crime plan to the demands of those, those communities. Their interests will most definitely be represented. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dunn. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is also probably to both uh, Vera and Sue. Um, I think you both talked about uh, representing the public and, and about supporting victims of crime. Well, I'm a councillor in Biker, and one of the things that most um, concerns residents in Biker and is the cause of much anger and frustration um, is actually sentencing. Uh, and I suspect that's a similar response from within the police themselves. Um, and I'm just wondering whether um, you could both undertake to raise these concerns with the Justice Secretary. It is an issue. People see that people are, ca are caught, convicted of crimes, and then the next thing, they're back out on the street doing the same thing again, harassing communities and citizens, good citizens, and, and they feel very vulnerable in their communities because of it. So sentencing is an issue, and I'd just like to hear that you could take that up. Thank you. It, it is something that is very, very important, and actually this is why I, I was, you're very, very lucky with your police crime commissioner, with the understanding of the, the legal profession that, that she does have. And I actually think this is where 
it's extremely good that the Police Crime Commissioner is involved together with the police representatives on the local criminal justice board because we do all need to work together right across the criminal justice system. I think we do need to look carefully. It's not all about sending people to prison, and we are all aware of that, and, and I wouldn't want to go down that route, but it is about making sure that the communities understand the sentences that have been given and can see the benefits that are there. The Police Crime Commissioner has talked about sort of working in partnership with others around diversion schemes. We're actually hoping to be able to stop getting young people put, put into the system in the first place. But although the sentencing issues aren't ours alone, I do think we have all got to work together to make sure that our communities understand the sentencing issues that are there. Um, I, I suspect that the, um, that the local criminal justice board is going to be harder uh, for me to cooperate with fully, not because there's any lack of will on my side, than the community safety partnerships. The judiciary, rightly and properly, uh, have a strong sense of their own independence. Um, however, there have to be links across, and diversion, as the Chief Constable has said, is a very important point. I think that a, a way in which it will become possible to raise sentencing issues with the judiciary in the broadest sense will be if we can perhaps uh, use from time to time some crime reduction monies or some community safety partnership monies to offer packages which are alternatives to sentences which they currently have. And then if we can compose something like that, we can present it to the judiciary and offer it as an option, and they will have very different focuses, which you can make sharp packages, strong packages, curative packages, uh, and, and so on. And I think that that might um, introduce a mechanism by which we can try to bring um, all those aspects of the criminal justice system closer together, right the way from community safety partnerships to the judiciary. Because I think although they're proud of their independence, and rightly so, I don't think that they are unaware um, of public opinion at all. And I think that they're as keen as the rest of us to help cut crime. So it perhaps it's a, a bridge building operation which, which needs to be tackled. Thank you, Councillor Bricky. And I think this is the last question. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my question, I think, is primarily for the Chief Constable. Um, I was very pleased to hear of your commitment to neighbourhood policing teams. I think we're very lucky in Jasmine we've got a, a, a good neighbourhood policing team. But we have one particular problem, which is we have a lot of antisocial behaviour between midnight and 5 a.m. Our neighbourhood policing team almost always clocks off at midnight or 1 a.m. at the latest. I think a lot of people in the community would really like to see that changed. I'm told it would take a decision at chief constable level to get the shift pattern altered. Uh, and I'd be very grateful you could look into that, uh, because it's certainly, I think, something that the community would want to see. There seems to be a, a waste of resources Obviously, resources are very tight. We see people on patrol at times when it doesn't seem to be most vital to the community. I, I, I get blamed for everything, and I get sort of given a whole, a whole arrangement of powers immediately. Um, in relation to shifts, I do expect my local neighbourhood policing teams to be working shifts that are conducive to the communities that they're policing. But of course the issues are that in Jesmond there are also significant issues that occur during the day that you also want police officers to be there for. So we do have to look at the balance. I actually expect all of my officers to be addressing your needs in your communities and the response teams, I'm sure Gary will take it away and, and look at this again. The response team should be supporting their neighbourhood colleagues but it's always within the gift, and I'm going to put it back onto him, the gift of the area commander to tell me what his communities need, and then we can readdress the shift patterns accordingly. Right, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure to have you. Thank you very much.
Right, agenda item number nine, appointment of chief executive. Under the prescribed standing orders in part 4G of the employment procedure rules in the Newcastle Charter, the council is recommended to approve the appointment of Pat Ritchie as the city council's new chief executive. And does council approve? Agreed. Right, thank you very much. Congratulations. Right, item 10, reports referred from cabinet, which is priority business as deferred from the November meeting. The first item is welfare reform and a call on Councillor McCarty to introduce the report for information and discussion. Thank you, Councillor McCarty. I'm sorry, but, uh, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't listening, sorry. Uh, um, uh, just to clarify a little bit, although I do not myself have to declare a personal prejudicial interest in this matter, uh, it is uh, my employers would rather that I withdraw on this particular agenda item. Right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I have brought this along um, as I made a commitment uh, when I brought my um, most recent report to Council and that we would bring along as much information as we possibly could share um, for colleagues across the Council Chamber to make sure that they are um, very clear about the changes um, that are um, proposed through the welfare reform um, uh, initiatives, I think, from the Government uh, and to uh, ensure that um, members of council have as much information as possible. Um, I think what we've tried to do in this report, Lord Mayor, is to um, look at case studies so that individual families could be considered, so it isn't a kind of academic exercise, but we've tried to um, uh, put it into uh, real situations that members could understand. Uh, and as colleagues will see, there are some shocking outcomes for families, uh, in particular families with children and disabled people. Um, the, the issue around the welfare reform proposals, of course, is that there's no big bang, so there isn't a day when everything happens. It will happen for individual claimants over, over some months, um, and there are some real, I, I don't know, insidious changes. Um, the bedroom tax is one of those disgraceful proposals um, where for some of us who have spare bedrooms, um, we accept that. Um, for others, they're going to have to pay a significant amount of money each week. Um, and Lord Mayor's taxpayers, we are all paying for the Prime Minister's two homes. I think that's unfair. Um, the, the proposals are, that are being made for under 35s and for under 25s, I think, are pretty dreadful. Uh, and if you set that alongside individual people who are not paying their fair share of tax, I think these things are really shocking. Um, people like Philip Green, some of the companies who are avoiding paying tax that we've seen quite a bit written about nationally, Starbucks and Google, and, and a whole range of others. Um, you know, they, I believe the government need to do something about that rather than hitting the poor uh, at every possible opportunity. Um, we've included in this report what the council is doing in response to this, and there are a whole raft, as, as members will see, a whole raft of initiatives. I think some of the key things, we've, we've introduced a corporate debt policy so that we don't have bailiffs chasing families for small amounts of money from several sections of the council. <coughs> We're trying to do that corporately. Um, we're doing a huge amount to promote um, affordable credit. Uh, we are doing a huge amount of work through the customer service centre so that residents can go in terms of a kind of one-stop shop um, idea for support so that residents can call into those centres, ask about issues around fuel poverty, um, find out who best to approach if they're in, in need of support. Uh, and indeed, a report that's coming to Cabinet uh, in the very near future on energy switching is another really good, I think, council response to try and address the issues. Um, we've also got members leading on their own projects, so we've got a pilot project underway in Elswick, which is being supported by the um, ward budget in, in that ward uh, and at the members' request, so obviously those kinds of initiatives in local areas are also being supported. The council um, is doing a huge amount of work, of course, but they can't do it on their own. They're working with partners in the uh, voluntary and community sector and indeed with colleagues in YHN. We've included in the report that's before us tonight um, the uh, approach that uh, your homes and castle are taking as well uh, in relation to their tenants, a number of whom will be hit by these dreadful proposals. Uh, Lord, may I ask <coughs> council to receive this report for information? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Right, Councillor Faulkner. 
you, Lord Mayor. Can I thank uh, Councillor McCarthy for the report? Um, it was debated at length at a uh, Cabinet meeting, and I was able to participate in that discussion. And at that meeting, uh, a lot of uh, Labour Cabinet members and uh, Deputy Cabinet members spoke with obvious uh, concern and care and uh, compassion about uh, uh, people and categories, groups of people who uh, will suffer through some of these changes. Uh, and it is true, and I hope they'll acknowledge that, uh, that Liberal Democrats uh, also share some of these concerns and that we have uh, campaigned against the severity of a lot of the changes, especially the effects uh, on disabled people and on uh, low-income people with children, and also the fact that so many of these um, uh, changes um, have a kind of cumulative impact on the same uh, groups of people. Um, and I think that, I hope that's something that in time can be reviewed and revisited. Um, the Liberal Democrats have attempted to be proactive with, within the coalition uh, and have influenced, I, I do believe, some of the changes in a beneficial way, in preserving the mobility component of uh, DLA, of dis disability living allowance for people in care homes, um, blocking the 10% cut in housing benefit for people on job seekers allowance that, that was proposed, and so on. And also, I think, to have reviewed the, um, the work capability as assessments, which were actually introduced under Labour, uh, but I don't think operate very well or fairly. Um, however, um, having said all that, um, uh, Labour do seem to be in a position, and we'll hear it again tonight, of pretty much opposing every set of changes that are introduced, irrespective of justification or circumstances, and I had understood uh, that all parties accepted the need for significant reform of welfare based really on three issues that needed tackling. Uh, the first was that the system is too complex, it's incredibly complex and it needs simplifying. It's one of the reasons why so many people who are entitled to benefit don't get them and why we have to spend so much money on welfare rights schemes to help them. Secondly, that, uh, uh, that the current welfare system, the system of benefits, have become a barrier to getting people into work, and you all know about the benefits trap and the income consequences of that. And thirdly, that the welfare bill had become far too large and had grown disproportionately, uh, almost somewhat uh, out of control. And one example really was spending on tax credits, which had gone up from, uh, from 18 to 30 billion pounds uh, in six to seven years, uh, to the point where nine out of 10 families were actually receiving some form of tax credit. And it needed greater focus on those in greatest need. And I'm sorry, but I do believe, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that all parties agreed with those three statements that I've just made and were interested in, in reform. And yet Tony Blair shelved all of Frank Field's proposals for reform and Gordon Brown uh, stonewalled the reforms that were proposed by David Freud. Uh, and, and I think that's a matter of regret that, you know, you come along now when, when you would have had a chance when times were much better and the economy was in better heart to actually have uh, tackled some of these changes. Uh, it seems to me that you can't have it all ways. On universal credit, which is featured in the report, um, I do think it's a legitimate and, and bold attempt to both uh, simplify the system by integrating six different means-tested uh, benefits and to give the right work incentives because uh, it would withdraw benefit at a much more clear and consistent and fairer rate as people move into work. Uh, and again, I would have thought that was something that might be appreciated, and it's a model that many advanced uh, economies and welfare states uh, do actually operate. Uh, and might I just say finally that a very big missing element in how we run our welfare system uh, is, is not recognizing the need for a much more unified, joined up, cross departmental approach uh, based on shared budgets and shared systems instead of the uh, very many different uh, departmental silos. Uh, there is money, but it's very often tied up in these departmental silos uh, and, and departments do not necessarily work with each other. And that change, which I think we will begin to see, is implicit in universal credit as well. So, you know, my conclusion is that, is that, um, that times are tough and a lot of these changes are going to impact very harshly on families. I do understand that. But, but you might just make the point sometime that you've had the opportunity to, to, to shape your reform of the welfare system and consistently fail on all counts. Thank you. <coughs> right, Councillor McCarthy, since no one else wants to ask any questions, do you want to... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Councillor Burke, I didn't see him. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. I will be brief as well this evening. I need to pick up on a couple of points that Councillor Faulkner did make, especially, I think, sort of on the benefit trap. Of course, I think what Councillor Faulkner did neglect to say that was in 1997, the average marginal rate, so disincentive rate, was sort of 90% of earnings, which that reduced in 2010 to 70%, which I think was progress going forward. And of course, he mentions the big cuts to tax credits, which in fact makes it even more of a disincentive to work. Um, I do believe for the first time, actually, when the coalition do trump out by saying it doesn't pay better to be on benefits than be in work, only under this government is it in fact better at times to be on benefits than in work, given some of the changes that they've made to the tax and benefit system. And I think today we saw an extremely regressive autumn statement, which we've seen many benefits to people that are mainly good people in work being capped at very much below inflation. Plus, of course, for millionaires, they didn't get a reversal and they'll be getting £100,000 every earning over a million pounds come next April. I also think that it's particularly appalling today in the autumn statement that the Chancellor stood up and said that everybody on benefits simply lie around in bed all day. I think we all know on both sides of the chamber that is not the case. I'd also like to update the Council quickly on the work that YHN are doing. I know they've got a bus operating um, at the moment and also working very hard to income maximise for their tenants and promoting exchanges where applicable. However, there is no doubt that about 7,000 tenants across the city um, in all um, wards in the city as well are going to be deeply affected by this. So I do encourage members on both sides of the chamber that if they need any details on the work YHN are doing, please contact me. I'll happily pass on to them or any of their tenants groups are affected. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll be brief. I just, I just really wanted to make a specific point. Um, on page 21, 3.5, um, it, the report states that government believes the new system will be fairer as it will always make work pay. And it goes on to say it's based on a perception that it is unfair that people who work can be worse off than those in receipt of benefits. I'd like to ask Councillor McCarthy whether the Labour group actually believe um, that that's, that's correct because. Um, it, I think it's much more than a perception, it's something that's shared by the vast majority of the population that people who work should be better off than those who don't. Um, and as a candidate in the last election, I came across, time and time again, I came across people who wanted to work, who quite often had been offered a job, but found that it just wasn't worth their while because they would lose money. So it, it, while, whilst we may not agree on the way that uh, we've gone about this, um, it, it, to me it seems clear that if you're working hard, you will resent somebody who, whatever position they're in, um, but particularly those who could work and don't, um, if they're actually earning more money or getting be more benefits than somebody who, who uh, is, is really trying very hard, working very hard, um, perhaps with a low paid job, <coughs> and really struggling. And, and you know, do, do you agree that people should be better off working? Thank you. Nobody else but Councillor McCarthy. <coughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you to colleagues for their questions. Um, uh, I think um, Mike's comments about the um, contribution that YHN are making uh, are very clear. Lord Mayor, um, we have huge concerns about tenants across the city, not just YHN tenants, actually tenants in, in other settings too. Um, the, uh, David challenges us about the Labour government. Uh, I think none of us on this side of the council chamber were actually in the last Labour government, so couldn't really um, make that decision. But actually, it's the, it's the um, party that the people opposite um, are supporting that are um, propping up the Tories' disgraceful proposals, <coughs> which I understand include a further £12 billion pounds cut uh, today that's been proposed by the um, Chancellor which is putting families into despair, and, and that's of huge concern to us. Um, and in, in answer to Councillor Taylor's question, um, more than half of the um, welfare budget, as I understand it, goes to pay for the state pension. Um, it's probably true around perception, but um, I'm um, not going to comment on that because I don't actually um, have the details of that in front of me, uh, and so I would want to um, consider that in, in more detail. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Right, thank you very much. The next item, sorry, missed, yeah, our pledge to tenants. Um, I call on Councillor Murison to introduce the report for information and discussion. Thank you, Councillor Murison. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll, I'll take the same brevity I had earlier. I'm conscious that we are, we are quickly moving towards the guillotine, and so I will simply say that um, this council is absolutely and completely committed to lifetime tenancies, and as long as it remains a Labour council, it shall continue to do so. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Sorry. 
Item 11, Cabinet Members Update. Uh, Councillor Stevenson to introduce the report and understanding orders again. Up to 25 minutes will be set aside for questions and Councillor Stevenson to reply. So again, ask Council to adhere to the standing orders, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> As you'll appreciate, I haven't much of a voice, but nevertheless, we'll see how we go. Um, it gives me pleasure to update Council on the report on behalf of Councillor and Weiss and myself on customer services and corporate services. As you'll see in the report, the portfolio um, heading has changed, and we've, but we certainly have not changed our tack in the way we work. We work very closely and put people very much at the heart at everything that we do within the council, and we feel, feel that that is a priority within the portfolio that we work in. Um, we are very much acutely aware of the massive impact of the Savage Cuts will have on not only communities but on the staff um, working in the council and beyond, in the city indeed. And we know that we face a very tough few years with mounting cost pressures and cuts in government grant combining to make life very difficult for everyone in this city. One of our administration's priorities is a fit for purpose council and this underpins the delivery of all that we do within the council. And just to point out one or two of the um, portfolio headings, um, just for information further, that we are delighted that we are working towards our manifesto commitment to adopt a customer first approach to customer service. This, as you recall, was part of our commitment in the manifesto and we have been working and involving residents in consultation across the city about the customer service experiences that we have, not just coming into customer services, but on a daily basis and what they feel that the organisation is offering to them. And we have showed that one in two residents have contacted the council for a variety of reasons within the last 12 months. <coughs> in addition to that, we are continuing to look at our communications, written communications, letter forms, as we reported previously to council. And we are also moving towards looking at um, the forms and the reports that we are working um, on through uh, cabinet and other committees to look at how they are um, in effect English, plain English and well written without jargon so people can understand them. We've also made progress with our uh, single point of contact with the launch of our 27878 number and we are moving in January to bring more services into that number um, which will give us cost savings within the council in turn. Councillor White and I both went to, uh, out into the community and into the various offices to um, see the staff at work in relation to what they were doing with some of the new initiatives that had been put forward and it was very well received. We always enjoy spending time where possible to look at new initiatives on a first-hand experience. And I would just like to place on record uh, verbally um, our congratulations to all staff involved um, in just the just external just assessment of the Council's yeah, customer yeah. service excellence status. I think we would all agree that's something that is quite an achievement in difficult times where continuing to maintain very high standards in customer services. Um, when the report went to scrutiny committee, there was a number of questions asked um, by scrutiny in relation to the Granger market and some of our community buildings. Um, I would just like to inform Council that there is to be work done in conjunction with um, the Granger market that have been prioritised um, and is yet to start in relation to the entrances to the Granger market. There were some questions asked around the entrances and was there any improvements going to be made on signage. That will be happening. We all know over the next three years the Council will become a very different kind of organisation moving towards different models of working, service delivery, and we need to work more effectively with communities to shape services according to different needs, uh, whilst finding new ways of delivering services through variant different community-led commissioning with and alongside residents and the communities we serve. I think this will be a challenge for everyone. I did state at a recent cabinet meeting that this is not just a city council challenge. I firmly believe this is a citywide challenge. If we are to um, 
move forward and continue services we need to encompass not just our staff, not just our residents, we need to encompass our partners and businesses within the city to help us to work for the benefit of the city, which is indeed what we all are here for. Corporate health and safety, I'm very pleased to report that despite the changes we've had to make um, already, we are um, uh, indicating there's a downward trend in serious accidents and incidents, and this is continuing. So the work being done there is tremendous. And I would just like to highlight the occupational health in the report that I've written, um, that their assessment skills across a range of mental health conditions with a focus to understanding patients' prognosis and capabilities in relation to work and dealing with change, which I think is something we all know there is going to be a lot of. Uh, there is a pilot underway to work more closely with managers and HR to work more jointly to address these stress cases, which are very complex. So that case planning is better coordinated and staff are, are supported in whatever needs they have. So with that, Lord Mayor, um, I will be happy to take any questions um, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <coughs> yes, Councillor Higgins. Thank you. Right, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that Councillor Stevenson emphasised the importance of customer service. Um, we do have a concern on this side about uh, the proposed closure of a number of facilities, um, and particularly those that are covered by the MIF programme and PFI. Um, and to give an example, the, um, the Customer Service Centre on Shields Road is a PFI building um, with costs ongoing of £54,000 a year for the next 20 years or so. Do you, do you realistically think there's going to be an opportunity <coughs> to get somebody else to take over that building with such a high ongoing cost even before they start to pay for any um, cleaning, heating, etc.? Um, so uh, I, we do feel that's a major concern. Right, thank you. Councillor Schofield? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question to Councillor Stevenson is around the local broadband plan. Um, and its role in include, um, increasing digital inclusion citywide um, by giving access within localities. The reason for my question is that access to digital technology and the ability to use it are increasingly critical to financial <coughs> and social inclusion and people's health and well-being. Yet we have within the city a very serious digital divide in that for many of us, and certainly people within this council, um, we have access to all forms of digital technology, gizmos and gadgets, and we take them for granted um, in our daily lives. We shop, we use it for leisure, we use it for appointments, job opportunities, networking, etc. Yet over 48,000 households do not have access to the internet, and many within those households do not know how to use it. So that limits their life chances and their quality of life. For many people, very significantly, 80% of benefits will be accessed online, job opportunities, etc. For them, not having access or the ability to use the internet will put their security and even their survival at risk. So I would like to hear what the uh, broadband plan for those would be. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Councillor Stevenson mentioned the uh, Granger Market. 
I was just wondering if there's any further moves afoot to uh, have a word with all the traders and see if anyone fancies going to Sunday trading. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Um, yes, uh, it is my intention, it is our intention, as things progress with the pilot, to bring back information to Council because we do recognise that the debate we had just in recent months in Council, there was unanimity across the Council uh, for concerns raised in uh, relation to mental health aspects and stigma and the way staff feel and generally the way people feel in, in communities in relation to this illness. Um, so yes, that, that's not a problem. With regard to customer services, uh, Councillor Taylor, yes, there is concerns around the BFI. Um, the, the discussions around changes are out for consultation. Um, it is my um, impression that there will be some services relocated, and it may not necessarily be that Shields Road is, is one of them. There is our proposal that are put out for consultation, and when we do get those um, after the end of the consultation, these are things we'll be looking at much more clearly to see where we're going in relation to wider aspects and how any other changes may impact on some of the proposals that have been put forward. But yes, PFI is something that we are conscious of, and quite rightly so, because of the funding elements that you that you quite rightly outlined. Um, Councillor Schofield, community build, uh, communities and um, digital inclusion. Yes, this is one of the things through the broadband that we are delighted that um, we as a city have managed to attain funding for the local broadband. Um, we are aware very much so in the report that was taken to the Cabinet of the need to not only give access to residents in communities to um, the, the hardware, but also be able to give them the assistance in training and the wherewithal and confidence to actually use with confidence all the new technology and bring forward the benefits to them that this can bring. One of the ways of doing this, we are in discussion with YHN around looking at use of some of their buildings, some of their community rooms in um, maybe older residents' um, housing, um, sheltered housing or indeed uh, high-rise buildings. This is one of the things that we are looking at to accommodate these facilities as they come forward, in addition to other hubs which communities use, libraries and other venues within the community that basically the communities will be coming forward to with us um, to say where is best accessible for them because it's a partnership with the communities we're working with to allow everyone access to some form of either training or support or confidence building in the use of the new technology because Councillor Scoff is quite, quite right. We are moving very much towards an online service for a, a wide variety of things, um, not least within our own organisation in the City Council. So accessibility is very important for residents of all ages. And finally, Councillor Gallagher, um, we did have a question recently at Council um, on the Sunday trading for the Granger Market. The Granger Market traders do have an organisation and at present the majority of the, of the traders who work in the Granger Market do not wish to change their working pattern to work on a Sunday. We have to respect that they have a special organisation and clearly they are working um, uh, the way that the majority of those traders um, prefer to work. So, so we are taking into consideration their thoughts in relation to that. But thank you all for your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Right, this is now 8.30. The guillotine has fallen. And I will now deal with the remaining business on the agenda as follows. I will call each item on the agenda in turn, inviting the member in whose name the items stand to indicate whether he or she wishes the matter to be dealt with and put to the vote without discussion or postponed to the next ordinary meeting of the council to be dealt with as priority business. So the next, are you all right, Hazel? 
Right, so, so the next item on the agenda is the annual review of the Newcastle Charter. Call on Councillor Bartlett. But Councillor Bartlett, what? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like this dealt with tonight and I move the report. Thank you. Is that agreed? Right, thank you. Right, funding for weekly resi residual waste collection, Councillor Muirson. What do you want I'd to like do? to move it, Lord Mayor. <coughs> I'd like to move the report, Lord Mayor, tonight. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, is that agreed? Right, thank you. Right, City Council. <laughs> right, the City Council Outstanding Actions Update Priority Business as deferred from the November meeting. Councillor Bartlett, what do you wish to do? Yes, I'd like to remove the report uh, this evening. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Right, agreed. Agreed, thank you very much. And petitions, update, report, priority business is deferred. And to call on Councillor Bartlett to introduce that information again. Uh, yes, move the report this evening. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Right, agreed? Agreed. agreed. Right, the, the, the appointments are set out as in the, in the agenda. Are they agreed as set out? Agreed. Thank you. Right, all the questions by members now, questions one and two will receive a written reply. And they go on to note to the final go on to the notice of motions. Um, the notice of motion, the government policy disadvantaged children, which is priority business deferred at the November meeting. I understand that Councillor Cott is unable to attend anyway this evening and the motion um, is asked that the motion shall be deferred to the next meeting. Is that agreed? No? Right. Okay. Just asked. So do you want to vote? All right. Well, there isn't a proposer, is there? So can't be moved. No. There isn't a proposer. Not here. I mean, if we're not going to allow it to defer, it's not going to be hmm? If we're not. Well, we have to defer it. Well, no, we don't. If, 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 if it's not moved, it can be deferred. Well, what does it do with it? Right. Right. I've been advised that that one actually falls. Right. If you're saying that the, because the proposal wasn't here, the motion falls, uh, it was therefore wasn't debated and therefore it could be represented at the next meeting. In another form? Yes, has to be the case. Right, just a minute. I've, I've deferred to my advisor thank you lord mayor the, the standing orders aren't uh, very ex lord mayor the, the standing orders aren't very explicit on this point i did refer to knowles on committee meetings and procedure and the view expressed in knowles was that the safest course of action was to regard the the motion as having fallen if it wasn't moved <coughs> i mean there are provisions in the standing orders about the representation of um, motions at Standing Order 14, I believe, from the top of my head. Only after they've been debated. Sorry? Only, the rules are only about motions that have been passed. And if uh, it hasn't been passed, it hasn't been debated. The, uh, the, the, the Standing Order refers to, to, to motions that have been negated. Lord Mayor, the, the motion could be withdrawn, but that would require the consent of the Council. Could, 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 could you just sit down, because I'm speaking to David. Right, could you not just have a private discussion, please, if you could stand up and address any questions to me. Thank you very much. I'm just getting... Lord Mayor, as I said before, my view is that the, the motion falls because it hasn't been presented. 
Well, I accept what I've been told by my legal advisor that, that this particular motion falls at this time. Thank you. Right, final motion, the government cut to the council budget. Um, Councillor Forbes. Can I move it, Lord Mayor? Is that amendment. agreed? Right. It's okay. It's the amendment, Lord Mayor. Right. Lord, Ma Lord Mayor, the motion needs to be moved, seconded, then the amendment needs to be moved, and then seconded. Right. Who's going to remove, move the amendment? Who is? Right. <laughs> Councillor Faulkner, and seconded by Councillor Stone. And Very well. And Thank then, you. Lord Mayor, the vote needs to be taken on the amendment. Please. Yes. Very well. We should take the vote on the amendment. Thank you. Named vote. Right. Can we ring the bell? Right, we're voting on the amendment. Final vote. So it's yes, 16, abstain, no. The amendment means it's no, 37 the, right, on the amendment. So the amendment fails on, on that particular motion. Thank you. Is that the end? Right. And I've got the last. Sorry, is that right? Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Right. right, the final motion, Runaways Charter, Councillor King. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, oh, sorry, yes, it's getting, the hour is getting late and I'm tired. Right. Have the vote, please. Thank you. <coughs> right. For the motion. 37, abstain 8, no 7, total 52. Right, the motion is passed. Right, thank you for that. Right, um, the final item is the runaways charter and I call on Councillor Kingsland. Councillor Kingsland, wherever you are, there you are. Right, put it to the vote. Right. Agreed, everybody agreed on that one. Right, thank you very much everybody. I know the hour is late. I hope you all get home safely. Thank you. Well, they can bring it back in another form, maybe, next time. Let's redo it. Yeah.